You're listening to The Craft, a podcast for professional content creators who want to learn more about the people, process, and strategy behind the best content on the web. In each episode, we talk with writers, designers, and editors from the world's leading content teams and learn the secrets to their success. Let's jump in and get you inspired for your next story. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Craft, brought to you by Shorthand. I'm Dawn Murden, VP of Customer Success here at Shorthand. Today, our very special guest is Ava Dominiguez, who runs the storytelling consultancy and agency Immersive Creatures. She also works for publications like El Perdico, De Cataluna, and La Vanguardia Digital. Ava, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me, and I feel really honored. Brilliant. Well, I'm going to dive straight in. So we know you um, at shorthand because of your work with El Peridico. That's where we've got to know you. Please, can you just tell me about your work um, that you're doing at El Peridico at the moment? We are working uh, with El Peridico to um, help them launch new storytelling forms. We are experts on, on digital storytelling with, on the web and also on, with augmented reality. And uh, they ask us to help them introduce new ways of storytelling, right? So we did a consultancy with them and then I recommend them to try long form because they weren't doing anything, such, such long form stories. And then we were uh, looking for tools and we recommended shorthand for them. So during the first month, we were producing any kind of stories with them. We had a meeting every week and then journalists came and they were telling, we were brainstorming stories. And then that was a process that we were creating with them, these visual stories in a way that they could learn during the process. So it was very successful because after, I would say, nine months, 10 months, they were creating also stories. So they were happy with the process because now they, I think they create a lot of stories every week. And we have stopped to create stories, you know, based on photography and on many other formats. And we have focused only on on the formats that we are specialists like just as a, a comic graphic novel and augmented reality and we have started to produce the first pieces uh, of augmented reality uh, journalism for, for them amazing thank you so much for talking me through that and i was actually going to ask you about the illustrated slash kind of comic stories that you've done some of them have been amazing what are the challenges of producing those kinds of stories well i always say that we can tell we can make journalism with comic for any kind of story but this is not so easy okay because first because we don't want to create breaking news you know it's, it's a big effort to so we try to make a stories that are going to last for a long time and the, the you can reuse all over you know one time and another one and another one and there are, we try to produce features that we see that the story is going to be alive for a long time and this is the the, the first requirement because sometimes Journalists come, you know, with a big, big idea for a comic and uh, it's going to last only, you know, 15 days. Let's say the Olympics. Okay, yeah, the Olympics only last 14, you know, 15 days and then you're going to spend a lot of time producing these stories, a lot of effort. So this is the first criteria. The second criteria is that it has to be a story that we can create scenes that we can explain visually the story. And um, sometimes journalists think that they need the picture. I mean, they have the photograph. If they have the photograph or, the, or they have an idea for illustration, that makes a story. And uh, we always say, if you already have the, the, the picture, you don't need the comic, right? So well, we, can, we, we need to create a story that are made of a sum of scenes. Like we always work with, with the storyboard. So we have to create a story of, of the story. And uh, sometimes, you know, 
we start creating the story with them and we see that there are many gaps in the story that they are not visual uh, scenes that we can represent because we're trying to not use the illustration as just something that is accessory. It's a way of explaining the story. So the scene is important. And we always do comment every scene, where it happened, how it happened, so we can recreate it, right? So this is one, one thing. So this is the second criteria that it has to be represented in a scene. And that makes a lot of work because sometimes they give us very, only the facts, right? And I say, yeah, yeah, but now I need to know where, how do you have, because normal journalists have much more information, but they don't think it's, it's useful for the story because this is not where they are used to uh, write. They don't write about the details of the scene, how was the room. They don't think about recreating the scenarios. And we try to recreate the scenarios and actions. And the third criteria is has to have action. Sometimes they, you know, some of the stories are just facts, one and it's a sum of facts, but there is not action, no movement. For example, there are many, you know, stories about corruption. And this always happens in the court, right? <laughs> and there are many things in the court and say, okay, but you know, this doesn't make a story because you are always in the court talking to the judge and this is not going to be visual. So this is also a, um, a problem. So we always try to think about the scenes and this is the process that it takes a lot of, of time with them. Yeah. So this is our, our the third criteria that we follow. When we have this third criteria, then we, we start working right away with, with the journalist. And the process is they give us the facts, then we'll ask them a lot of questions so we can create the storyboard. We create the storyboard within shorthand already. So we uh, make the drawings in shorthand and then with the information and the drawings, the storyboard, we see how it works. If, if it's, you know, balance is okay. The story works. Okay. And, and when we, that the content and the story is what we think has to be, then the illustrator, Silver, just finish all the, all the drawings. Amazing. So the uh, kind of stories that lend themselves to this particular treatment very well are those where you don't have those visual assets that you need to kind of explain the story. Like you say, the court, I think court proceedings are such a great example of this. And you see the, the sort of drawings from court being used in different articles across the world to really sort of bring that to life and take the, the reader or the audience into the courtroom because they couldn't be there. Just thinking about the recent like Elizabeth Holmes case, which was huge, and you had so much of the court proceedings coming out in, in various ways of, of that. Do you think as well that these particular types of pieces, we're actually looking at some of the maybe best practices in that would usually be in fictional writing when it comes to these kinds of pieces? So you, you sort of the room and you're explaining the room and, or, you know, maybe even the smells and the sounds of when you're there and all of these kinds of elements that we think about in terms of storytelling, we often think about them maybe more in kind of fictional storytelling than maybe non-fictional storytelling. So, yeah, I just wanted to see if that idea, how that resonated with you. Yeah, yeah, because I wrote a thesis on a storytelling, on journalism, uh, journalistic storytelling, and more on immersive journalism, on the use of VR, AR, and so on. But one of the things I have to go to the core of what is a storytelling, journalistic storytelling, journalism has always used the, the current, what was currently used in a storytelling normally, you know, is, I mean, I always say that journalism is a son of its time. So it's using what is, you know, people are using right now. We see we have to adapt to TikTok or whatever platform or whatever new way of storytelling people are using or people are consuming. So it, journalism is, all, is, is also using all these new platform resources and languages. You have to use the language of your time. And comic is, is not a, a foreigner for journalism. You, we know Joy Sacco, for example, is a great reference in, in journalism. He's been using comic to tell really, you know, about Palestine and, and, and many other stories. So it's not a format that is not common to journalism, but it's always been in the 
like in the periphery of journalism, right? And it's normal because then you need to blend. Joy Sacco blends two capabilities, abilities in one. It's like he's a, an amazing illustrator and he's a journalist too. So normally, you know, journalists don't always have uh, these uh, two capabilities uh, or skills blended in, in, in one person. But it, it, you don't have to. You, uh, what is uh, journalism has to be always a team. Journalism is, is a team effort. And this is what we show. This is what we're trying to do. Showing them that there is a, a process that we can all learn and we can uh, understand uh, the same way that we can uh, use, we can create a TV show and there are many people involved with different skills. This is the same, right? So what is important is that you learn the language. So you need to think visually. And this is when you make this the script of the story, you are thinking visually and the resources. So it's something you can learn. And I think it's a lang- comic, it's a, la- it's a language, it's a format that has so many people that are, 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 you know, into it. And it's so good to make, to attract new audiences that I think more media should be trying this new format, right? I think it's a format that is very attractive and we have prove it with these stories because they had really a lot of impact. And it's really interesting sort of sort of taking my fictional comment aside, but you sort of mentioned this dis- distinction between breaking news and what you're doing, which I would say is much more fe- you know, feature journalism. And feature journalism covers such a broad field of different types of, of journalism, podcasts, TV shows, comic, jo- it's so, so much in there. And it's sort of, you said, we, you know, we don't do breaking news. You know, what you're doing is that fe- feature journalism and there's something really beautiful about the, you know, you said more people, more publications should venture into this kind of comic book way of telling stories. I think it's really, personally, I think it's ingenious because you're able to break down really complex issues that are happening within society or court proceedings, like you said, in a very digestible and very entertaining way. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. For example, the first uh, story we published with a graphic novel, that was a a big (laughs) corruption case in Spain. And there were so many news during the week. I mean, for so long that I think people was lost already. There were so many characters in the story. Uh, some of them were relevant. Some others were not relevant. There were so many breaking news about this that you, there is a point you get lost. As a citizen, you get completely lost. So what we did was, okay, let's go to the basics. Let's explain what is the main story. How this investigation began, who is involved, why, and you know what are the accusations, and, and and this is it because there were so many, so many other characters that were not so relevant that sometimes you get so lost because there are so many, you know, because media have been publishing about these stories for a long time because these core uh, topics takes you know takes a lot of time. And there are many characters and accusations and many politicians and many um, decorations and, and so on. So at the end, even even for journalists, I think you, you get completely lost. So our idea was, okay, this we are going to explain because we have a limit of scenes which we can draw. And we always tell it to the journalists, 15 is just the limit. More than 15 is impossible. Because it, it takes a lot of time and, uh, you know, we have to be rational with it. And so I fo- we focus on the main question. How did the investigation start? Why? How it was discovered? Who are the main characters involved? Where are the accusations? And that's it. And that's what we did. And it was so, I think that's, this is why it was successful. Because it's a story that it takes very short time to conceal. <laughs> but it takes a lot of time to create. But it, and that is why it's successful that many people finally understood what it was going on with this case. Absolutely. And your audience are going to be coming to you for you to break down those kind of complex issues and make sure that they are able to come to you, even if it's not, you know, breaking news, they want to eat even more bite-sized chunks, but then they want to go that step further with the feature news or feature storytelling. And they really want to be able to dive into the bits that they really need to know. 
And as the journalist, you're you know, providing a service there for your audience, aren't you? Making sure that they know what are the important parts of these issues that they really need to know and kind of cut- cutting around all of the stuff that they don't need to know. Yeah, I think as a journalist, our job is, it's always been like that, but I think now it's more important than ever to give people the stories to understand the world better, to understand. Because there is so much breaking news or you know, a story that you don't know what is relevant, what is not. So I think this is our job and, and we have to do it in a way that is even so attractive that people that would not have a previous interest in this story would watch it or would read it, right? This is, I think this is our challenge. That, okay, I'm not interested in this story, but the way it is, it is displayed is so interesting that you make them understand it and you make them interested in that topic. Definitely. And that's where you sort of mentioned sort of gaining new audiences or maybe, you know, that you, you didn't have before. Yeah, that's very important, especially for, you know, young audiences that are so visual. We have to create these other stories. And that, that doesn't mean always that we have to go to TikTok, which is also good. I mean, I think we have to <laughs> use whatever is available. But I think that there are many other formats that we can create that are also uh, very interesting, like this one. Graphic numbers are, are working uh, very well in a periodical. And in fact, we now have to create in the ask us to, to plan stories with the graphic novel for, for during the whole year. Amazing. What is the current state of the journalism industry in Spain and Catalonia like? And um, I noticed that El Periodico also has a paywall. So would you say that's becoming more common for, for journalism over there as well? Oh yeah, definitely. All, all media are, are switching to pay walls because they are all launching digital subscription model because pre-media have a less less buyers and they are getting older, right? So they are trying to switch, uh, that trying to get more digital subscribers with exclusive digital content. Like these, uh, all these, uh, shorthand stories are exclusive for, for online users or, or subscribers. And, and they also, they, because also they have this difficulty to attract new audiences and uh, this is the path to go. So I, I think it is very global, right? I mean, the, the challenges for media are very global everywhere. Do you, like how, if you sort of a lot of, you said a lot of publications are going down that paywall model. How do you ensure that that paywall model works and that you are providing enough to your audience to ensure that, you know, that paywall model works and that it's worth it for the audience as well? Now, this is the tricky part, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's quite everybody, a question. <laughs> everybody wants to know what is the key, right? Uh, I work from outside the news, never a really good. So I'm not out, you know, I'm not within the newsroom, so I don't know the details, but I think every media has to know a lot of their audiences, their, who they are, where they're interested, and have a more conversation with them. Build communities is very important to create communities that people feel attached to their, to their brand, to their media, and create the kind of content that this your community needs. And in this sense, every media can have a different offer and trying not to compete only with breaking news because this is, uh, it's hard. So creating special content, very unique content, this is what I think each media has to try to you know, to give value to your subscription. Otherwise, it's going to be, it's, co- it's complicated. You have a lot, in, in, online you have so much offer. So you can uh, subscribe to different media. The other day there was a, a new, I think that this data that subscribers of media, they usually subscribe to two media online. So on average, you subscribe to two media online. So that means that people, you know, that are willing to pay, they are also willing to diversify, right? They are choosing the uniqueness in each media. Yeah, absolutely. So you need to stand out from the crowd, don't you? And and do something, it's something different. But I guess also you need a variation of different types of content that you're you're bringing to to different audiences as well. Because, like you say, 
they might go to publication one for X and then they might go to publication two for, for Y and that might be different across the board. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I've been in, in this field for 20 years or I've been in the field of digital content, journalism, storytelling, and my, my feeling has, my passion is storytelling and new forms of storytelling. And when I was back in the 2000, when I tried to make all this, this type of content for the web and in, in media, it was impossible in Spain. It was, they, they, didn't, they didn't want to invest on that. It was so painful. But now it's so obvious for them that this is the path to go, that you have to give value. And that means new formats, good stories, uh, different stories that no one else uh, you know, can provide. So you have to differentiate your brand. Absolutely. And, and you mentioned then that you're really passionate about, about storytelling, about the future of storytelling, especially in the, new, the different formats that are emerging. What does the future, another big question, <laughs> what does the future of storytelling look like for you? Or, or what do you hope that it looks like as well across the board? Well, I believe in, you know, in that since 2013, I've been working with augmented reality because I think the web is going to be also three-dimensional. And three-dimensional really means special storytelling that, you know, we are going to interact with people in content in 3D environments, but also we are going to represent 3D stories. We are starting with the periodical to create augmented reality stories with Instagram. Instagram is, you know, people are using filters in a very fun way, but you can use them for other purposes. And we are proving that it can be used to create journalism. That's what we are doing. We're creating three-dimensional stories. And, uh, and the web is going to be also three-dimensional. So this is the path to go. There are many, many different ways you can do that. You can go big, it depends on, on the resources you have, but you can try small. And I think the first steps, you better try small. So you learn the language, you learn where it works, where it doesn't work. You said, you know, it's, a, it's an innovation path. And yeah, you can do a little reality, but what I'm also looking for a lot is that 3D elements can be embedded on the web. And right now you can only do this with uh, JavaScript code, um, coding, right? But I wish that, you know, those years, Cherham, we could work this way, create in, embedding 3D elements and make them interactive because this is a trend. It's a big trend and, it, and it's the language of the near future. It's not a very long. <laughs> it's a, we don't have to wait until Meta is, is, <laughs> is real. It's going to be very, uh, very soon. Yeah, you really strike me as one of those people that's like right at the intersection of technology and, and journalism. And we, we I used to go to this, I haven't been for a while because of COVID, but they are starting it again. Hacks Hackers is a community. I don't know if they have it where you are, but it, it's great. And it brings technologists and journalists together to talk about the future of, of journalism and news. And at the beginning, you have to put your hand up and you have to say whether you're a journalist or whether you're a tech, uh, uh, you know, a developer or a tech person or put your hand if you feel like you're a bit of, a bit of both. So you kind of strike me as someone that, you know, you're kind of in the middle there. You're at both because you're a journalist at heart, but you're very committed to these new formats and new technologies and you're using the, those in order to tell stories. Yeah. You know, technology is a language, so you have mm -hmm. to learn it. It's, like, it's, the basic, it's the basis of the, of the society we live. We live. Everything is provided by technology. So it doesn't mean that you we all have to be coders. I learned to code like 20 years ago, and I learned to code to be able to work with the tech people, you know, with artists and with uh, all kind of profiles that you need to to create amazing content on the web and you know, online. So I love technology as a great platform and tool and language. For me, I think it's a language and. I think it's important that we all have some basis of this language because then it's very difficult that you can 
work with engineers or coders or because then you, you don't have this common language. You don't have to be, you, do their work, but you need to understand how they work. To create, I mean, I, I, I've been directing digital projects since 1999 and I can do so because I understand what, you know, all these different fields provide to the project. And sometimes there is a content requirement that is being exposed in a way that is very difficult for the technology guy, for example, to do it. But then you understand the needs of the content of a journalist or, or whoever is quite asking for that. And then say, okay, you don't need that really. You are giving the, a formula that is not the formula what you need. I understand your requirement. Let me talk to the technical department. I will find a formula for that. And then you do it in a different way and it's much easier. So it's, that's why it's important because the framework is different, right? So in, in order to, to have a framework that we can all work together, we need some basics of that. We, we all need to, to understand what technology provides. And I think coding, even is very basic, we all we should do something. <laughs> Because the understanding variables, I mean, it's, it's very basic. It's a language that we all should understand. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I learned to code. I, I was a coder for 10 years in a master in New York. I got the technological background that I needed for, for that purpose. I don't code it anymore, but I, it's still there. I mean, this is a great tool for the ministries. And, yeah, I, for me, it's difficult to understand how you can create or innovate if you don't have these basics right now. For me, it's that is it's difficult. Yeah. Mm, so you're almost like maybe a bit of a translator as well now, because like you say, you're not doing the code yourself. You're not kind of in, in the, doing the code, but you understand that. So when you're leading a digital project like these, like the, like the comic book projects that you're working on, you have a real understanding of the journalism and also the technology that's going in into all of that to, to make that end, the end result. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because to make great projects, you need very different profiles and very different people. You know, very different that have to uh, work to giving the same project as a team. So it's very important to have this common basis. In, in university teachers, before university teachers, I had a startup that it was named Nusho, and we created a project called Nusho. And in my team, there were coders engineers, journalists, artists, and we all brainstorm together every new chapter of this story because we had, a, it was an, an animated series on a meter with a meter reality. We've created the platform, we, we did everything. And when every time we had to create a new chapter, the brainstorming, a joint uh, process with all the profiles, with every, everybody that was there. It was not a content task. It was a task for the whole team because we were thinking about what kind of game we have to do, what kind of interaction, what kind of a story. And it was a mix up. And the best idea sometimes for content came from the coder and it was a very beautiful process. And we had so much fun doing that. Sadly, we had to <laughs> shut down the, the startups during the lockdown. But uh, we created something really innovative that had a lot of recognition for, from Google, from Finland. It was for, for kids and it has a certification of quality from Finland. And it was a, an amazing project. And I think the, the, the part of the secret was that that was with a creative team with different mm, skills. That's why we, we are all creative. Mm-hmm. It sounds like such an interesting project. Yeah, it, yeah, it was. It was an amazing project. We we created. It was a journalistic. Uh, it was journalism for kids. I created a, an animated story, a series with main characters, and you know, uh, it was a fictional story. But each chapter, each chapter, each, each adventure happened in the context of a real event. It was whatever you know, uh, the serious war, the melting of the ice, it, whatever. We we created forty chapter for 40 adventures. So kids could learn about what was happening in the world through this vehicle, which was this series. And for them was so much fun. And we created comic strips, 
an augmented reality with games and interactions with the character. It was, uh, it was very innovative, yeah. No, I'm sorry to hear that it got closed down in lockdown. Yeah, we, you know, we didn't have enough funding to keep, to keep it alive during the lockdown, so we could, yeah. In Spain, it's hard to, to get funding for this kind of projects. But it was a very yeah. nice experience. Yeah. Well, I hope you can start something like that again, because it sounds like it's so useful. We have a, like an education plan within shorthand to give shorthand to educational institutions for free. We find that it's so popular to as a way to, to teach journalism to future journalists. We found quite a lot of the universities did struggle during um, the pandemic, uh, of course, as well. Yeah, hello, yeah. I wish I, you know, the problem is that I'd rather never forget that it's, I think it's better than the last one. But I have to work it, you know, I have to find the the right circumstance and the right context to, to launch it because it's, uh, uh, the other one was too big and I had to do it in another way. But I think, yeah, yeah, the idea is there, the learning is there. The experience is that we were creating a special story, storytelling, you know, in, in, in many years ago. So we, the learning was very good with kids we, who are the best, the, the, the most, the toughest beta testers you can have per project. Mm. Yes, they are really, yeah, they are, it's like, a... <laughs> 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 they are not far, easy to convince. They are very used to play, and, but then they give you all. When they like it or they give you lots of uh, great feedback, it was a very an amazing experience. Yeah, brilliant. Well, back uh, going back to the technology and sort of the you know sort of VR and augmented re- reality. Um, it feels like we've only just scratched the surface of a lot of that and what could be possible as a as a journalist as a storyteller. What excites you most about what you could achieve? through VR and, and AR and have you got any examples of sort of particular issues or stories that you would really like to to tell using that technology? Well I already did with Nusha <laughs> so for kids and um that for me the challenge is not to tell one story. The challenge is to be able to create a language that allows you to tell many stories you know, in a regular basis. And I'm really keen of the possibilities of augmented reality, more than virtual reality, because first in virtual reality, you have an expert like Noni de la Peña, who is creating amazing uh, stories. But I love, I, I like the interaction with the real world that augmented reality and mixed reality can provide. And, and it's more, and it can, it also can be, um, sure, a very sure experience. When you are uh, wearing VR hel- uh, helmet, for example, or glasses, you are completely isolated. Uh, yeah, so it's completely like subdued, I guess, sort of in, in you are, the... you forget yeah, you are not in the world. You are in your in the digital world, you're completely disconnected from the real world. With augmented reality, it's not like that. Augmented reality, you can use it in any context. Okay, that's what I mean. And virtual reality, you need a special setting for that because you cannot be walking on the street using VR. Right. So I'm really excited about the possibilities that augmented reality and mixed reality is going to be the, like the, the next step of augmented reality when you are representing the 3D elements can interact with the real world. This is mixed reality. Right? So I'm really excited, excited about this. This is what I think is going to be a, a field of creating really stories that we cannot imagine right now. And for me, I would love to be able to create Nushu 2, I mean, the second version, and uh, an improved version of what, we, what I did, because I really believe in journalism for children. I believe in children are really interested in what is going on in the world. They have so much curiosity. The problem is sometimes they don't understand it. So if we, and traditional media, sometimes are not so, it's not so interesting for them. So what I experience with my project is that they love 
learning. They have really interest in the world and the way they learn it and understood real news was remarkable with this comic streets and games and, and with this kind of storytelling that we created. So, and the magic of augmented reality was really nice. Yeah. So I would love to do this. Yeah. Hmm. I guess, is there something about sort of being able to not fast track, it's not the right word, but sort of, I guess, like expedite the understanding of certain issues, especially for, for children in the classroom, because I think it's no secret that all around the globe, it doesn't matter where you're from, but a lot of us leave school not knowing half of the things that we think that we should know about the world when we leave school. So, you know, sort of what you're talking about there to be, to be able to expedite the understanding of certain kind of world issues at a young age might really help, you know, us as citizens when we, when we leave school to better understand the world that, that we're in. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, and it makes so much sense. It helps you also to learn what you need to learn in the school because when you connect what is happening in the world with what you need to learn in the school, the motivation is greater because then kids can, can see that, you know, what they're learning is useful because uh, they can solve real problems or they can, you know, understand real problems. That was a great motivation for notion because that's what we did. We tried to connect always with what was going on in the world with what you have to learn in the school. And a lot of the new immersive technologies, such as like headsets and Googles, they're being produced by the largest tech companies on the planet. Do you think that that presents a problem? And, you know, sort of in terms of the technologies maybe being owned by kind of specific big tech companies? Well, it's the same like mobile phones, right? I mean, we <laughs> have many brands, we have many different... I think is the the story of technology repeats itself all the time. So we have the beginner would have many, you know, few brands, and then we have more uh, creators that are more in uh, cross platforms and cross technologies. We are just beginning. To me, my concern is not so much about the technology because you know technology always goes very fast and it's getting faster and faster over time. Right now, we always we all have. Let's not forget we all have a mental reality too in our iPhone, in our phones. So we already have a platform for, for most of this content and nowadays. But my concern is about do we really think we can be like three hours a day using these glasses? <laughs> because now what all I see is uh, everybody is saying how amazing is virtual reality for education, for working, for video conferences, for uh, almost for anything. But we don't know the impact that the usage of this uh, technology has on our eyes and our brains for a long time. I mean, if we spend a lot of time in virtual environments that we are navigating in with virtual reality glasses, okay? So... I don't think we can use them for a long period of time. If you, I don't know if you've tried, but right now if you use them more than 10 minutes, you get sick. I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot. Of course, this is going to improve over time, of course. But now we are very excited about the, all the things we can do online, but it's not really right now very sensible to, to be using these glasses for a long time. We don't know uh, how it's going to affect our vision. How are you going to work brain? I think many studies have to be done. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's so true. I mean, through throughout the pandemic and through the lockdowns, we've all used you know, Zoom or Google Meets or other ways of meeting each other virtually o online. And I think there's hundreds, if not thousands of articles now talking about video conferencing fatigue and, and things like that. So we're, we're using this technology already more than we ever might have done if we hadn't, you know, found ourselves in the pandemic that we, that we have done. So yeah, I can completely see where you're coming from, from that side of things, because we already have technologies that we're already getting, you know, kind of fatigued with. So is that why as well, the augmented reality kind of side of things is really interesting because it's more you know sort of you mentioned augmented reality and sort of realities online 
So it's not virtual reality where you're completely, you know, sort of isolated in wearing, you know, sort of a, yeah, you're wearing that goggle or, or, or eyewear set, but actually that you're maybe engaging on your phone and it's more of like a mixed technology and perhaps is not all, all consuming like the, like VR perhaps is. Yeah, I think we're going to have different um, uses, uses and contexts in which we perf- we're not going to use augmented reality or virtual reality. And the advantage of, of, of virtual reality is it's is more easy to consume in our daily lives because we don't have to isolate ourselves and put a glass that right now we don't know how long is really reasonable to be wearing them. Right. So, and it's, uh, with the reality, you can create a small content very, you know, it's not so demanding. You can create small pieces and it's going to be more ubiquitous. It's going to be, it's going to be everywhere. But the reality is, is, is easier to apply and easier to create. It's going to be more, more common than virtual reality because that virtual reality has great, great usages too, but it's going to be preferred for, for other, of course, for Gaming and uh, we know that all the things that relate to gaming consumption and uh, fun is going to be technology that is going to succeed a lot. But for more for journalistic purposes and uh, other kind of communications that is not for that is more related to facts, I think a way to reality is um, is providing is is much better. It's going to be easier. To, to be in newsrooms than virtual reality. Yeah. And you kind of mentioned like the new technologies and different formats being the language of the time that we're in. And how, how do you feel about the personalization of, of news? And and not not just when I talk about personalization of news, I don't just mean you're kind of showing the regional news to the person where that person's based, maybe based on their questionnaire or something they filled in or previous search history or something like that I more mean being able to really per- personalize the journey that the audience is taken on through the really the experience that you're taking them on as the journalists and perhaps giving them different ways of consuming that information so I'm just thinking sort of you know, maybe you have a, a story that you publish and you have a comic book aspect that you could go through or maybe there's an aug- augmented reality as- aspect or maybe there is a VR aspect you know for these really big you know sort of societal issues take the corruption story that you did recently having different ways that different audiences can consume that how do you feel about that kind of of notion in journalism it's not personalization, right? What are you talking about? Because I, I understand personalization as, as my personal choices. And here, in, in, in fact, you are giving more offer on the final format that you can consume. Because I, mean, I guess, I guess you mean that you know more what kind of content the user is more keen of and that you can provide that. Is that? Yeah, so I mean more sort of if you were to release a piece on a particular feature and you have different ways in which you could consume that. So giving the reader different opportunities. So you sort of, I think of it like a flow chart and they they come in in this entry point and then there's a multitude of different routes that they can take to kind of reach the end point of where they feel that they've been educated on a particular issue. But they could go sort of loads of different ways of achieving that. Because I often feel like personalization of news and, and uh, information often gets talked about. But, you know, what, what do we mean other than, you know, sort of tailoring it to where they're based or things like that? It, it should, for me, it should be more about the different experience that they get because we all learn and consume information in different ways. So, for example, some people might like if it's like gamified because they consume information that work or some people might like a podcast or some people might watch to watch videos I guess I've kind of been yeah like it's kind of blending the personalization and the experience together to create the kind of perfect experience for the audience yeah and let's be aware also that the same person ha- can have different formats for different moments of the, of the day right there are moments that I only want a minute <laughs> you know with the news and there is a moment that I, I know I have time to listen to the podcast because I'm driving 
hard to the, you know, and so it's, it's not only for the person, but for the moments that each person is living. And so, yeah, I think we have to create the, the same story in different formats and times of consumption. Yeah, I agree with you. This we should, we, we have to do it because as I said right now, maybe someone is getting a news in a very, in a format that at that moment, this person that doesn't have the time to consume in this way, but he has the time to see, you know, a TikTok video or whatever. And it doesn't mean that the other format is not interesting for that person. It just means that it's not the, mo the right moment for that. Right. So I definitely yeah. agree with you. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I suppose the challenge then is for journalists and the, pub the publishers to decide how they do that because we don't have limited resources to do everything that we, we want to. <laughs> That's the unfortunate thing. You don't have resources, well, budget or people to be able to do everything that you want to do. So you need to decide how you're going to produce the, that particular piece on that particular issue. I think we should, this is something in, in which I think that um, artificial intelligence and all these new tools and technology should be a help for newsrooms that, you know, somehow this automatization of creating some formats, small formats from a basic one. Yeah, we have to experiment with that and trying to, yeah, to create so that we don't put journalists to do this kind of task then machines could do instead of us. And, and I guess that the machines could also look at the algorithms in terms of as well, if you like this, then you're going to like this and kind of give you the different different news or the different experiences that you that you might want to see there. But I don't think, you know, this is a, a knowledge and a, that I don't think is uh, in many years right now. The knowledge of how to use these tools, how to uh, maximize the effort you are already uh, making in a newsroom so that you can spread these formats to more people. Yeah. Definitely. So you mentioned your thesis earlier. Can you tell me a little bit more about your research interests? <laughs> You're very great. If you <laughs> ask me, <laughs> me this. Well, as I said, my, I'm one of these journalists that are always being interested in future journalism. In because I've been very curious about topics that I always want to, I wanted to uh, learn more about it. And breaking news always led me with a feeling of that unfinished task, you know, that I couldn't understand better. I was standing, understanding this a story and then I have to leave it and, and take another one, right? So for me, storytelling was very important, how to make this story interesting. So very early, I started to work in feature journalism in, in El Periódico. Uh, I was very young in El Periódico. Then, as I said before, the web came out. I, for me, was a to, to experiment a new language. And now this, this has been my, you know, my fashion, how to use a new language for journalism, whatever the language is, you know? So this is why I'm always researching and experimenting with emerging technologies because it's going to be a new language right now in the future. So in 2013, I published my, my thesis. Was in the, the title was Immer Immersive Journalism. You know, it was very difficult for me to find someone that could accept that this was the topic for my thesis because they told me that this was, it didn't exist at the time. And I said, it's going to exist. It's going to boom in some years because the basics is there. So what I'm going to explore is how this language is going to, what is going to be the basics of this language? What is, what is really immersive and what is not immersive? Right. So then I, I, that was my, my focus and not to focus on the technology, assume that just because you're using virtual reality is immersive. Okay, you maybe you have a degree of immersion that is based on the technology because you feel that you are somewhere else. You have this special immersion, immersion on the scenario, right? On the setting. But once you are there, is the immersion, how are you going to keep the immersion of the user? But then what you have is a wow effect. Wow. So now what? 
how are you going to create the story in this immersive environment? So that was my focus. Understanding what was immersive and what was not immersive. What kind of tool, what kind of feature was immersive or not? So that was my thesis. <laughs> so basically, there are two kinds of immersion. In the, one is the immersion in the setting, in the scenario, that you feel you are somewhere else. And then there is an immersion as a capacity of interacting with the content. That's what it, the video game industry it, is based on. The, no, you, you can do something. Uh, you can be so one, whatever. So how can, but then there is an, immer an immersion that is the most important one for journalism and, in, and is the immersion in the story. And this we know it for, for years, for decades. What is a book? How many people are you know, immersed in the book? What is the secret? So th that was my, my research. So there is immersion that is provided by the technology. And then there is the immersion that is provided by how you create the story using these technologies. So I don't want to. <laughs> no, it's so interesting. I was just going to ask what year well, your thesis was. My year was in 2013. So I published it. That means that I, I yeah. So I just started to create the thesis through writing it five years earlier. And yeah, yeah, at that time, nobody was talking about it. So I think yeah, it's Snow, the first, it's the first thesis Snowfall? in the world. I think Snowfall was it's out not by that yeah, time. Was that, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I think that was 2012, which is when we talk about the history of storytelling, we often reference as uh, Snowfall. So that was the, yeah, this is why when people, for me, immersive journalism is not just journalism created with immersive technology. Is a journalism that is immersive because you are using some of these features, right? And uh, so I was at the time I published the the thesis. Most of the content was web based. There was not a much reality content. There were, of course, the experiments and the that Novi de la Peña was doing with virtual reality. And I interview her, and since then I, you know, I have an acquaintance with her. She's uh, she's, uh, she's amazing. She's uh, an amazing woman. And, um, but for me, mess, the immersion is, it goes beyond, is, is bigger than only immersive technologies. Yeah. So I, I think it was the first thesis in the world. <laughs> because at that time, nobody was researching on that. <laughs> and you know why? Because in the academia, I always research when something is up there. I was researching something that was not still a trend. It was not a, a strong trend, but it was going to be a trend. And I was researching before that happened. And then in the, I think 2000, 2015, the video, 360 video exploded. And that nobody remembers now because, you know, and that was the first immersive format that people were talking about. It. And, and it, it seemed that it's going to be huge. And now there are not, you know, there are not so many 360 videos previous and continuous. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I feel like with 360 video, I got really excited about what could be achieved with it. And there was some, there was, I, I can probably count on one hand, the really impressive pieces that I saw that were, they were sort of, you know, embedded into, into pages and added something so, so kind of special, gave you that wow moment, like you mentioned it, that immersive story should do. But as I say, I could maybe just count. Uh, yeah, a few on my hand, and and then it see it seemed like it did explode, and it was everywhere for a bit. But some of it wasn't done particularly well, perhaps in my opinion. And then it just died. It just it just sort of went away, and it was it, it became a bit of a bit of a flavor of the month, I suppose, or of a flavor for the year. And then it felt like it just went away. And then it feels like no one really wants to explore three hundred and sixty video anymore. It feels like it's not. A big concentration. Would you agree? Well, you know, I, I always thought there was um, more production than consumption of 360 media. There was a, in the industry, there was a hype with it. You know, like, like all, you know, journalists were producing uh, 360 videos at, at, the mo at the moment, right? And that happened because it was easy to, to create. I mean, you didn't have to learn the coding or you didn't have to learn a very specific tool. It was uh, very close to video. 
video production and then you could do a 60, 360 video, but the language is not the same because you don't have to explain so much when you are immersed in a scenario. Yeah. So that's why, as you said, there, there were not many examples that were not very good examples. And people were not consuming it so much. Why? Because either you could watch it on YouTube, for example, I mean, on, on, it was a, a, a flat screen where you could see that the, 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 the immersive experience was gone. And if you and then you you required VR uh, glasses and nobody you know people don't have it. So I think it was there was an adjustment. There was no adjustment between the conception and the production. That people were you know were very excited. Yes. So the important thing is what is what is going to last. And these are the steps of you know of a new language that we are building, in which three dimensionality is going to be. And um, uh, this is for me the main, the main issue. We are walking the path to three, three dimensionality. So this is really a shift, a paradigm shift, a big paradigm shift, because we are used to create um, content in, for two, two D platforms and experience. And this is the language we have created for visuals, for everything. Perspective, point of view. What is the point of view? The point of view is a way off because you cannot create three-dimensional content. You have to fake it with point of view. So it's going to be huge. It's, that's why I'm so excited. It's going to be nice. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I've been thinking a lot of that and how, what it works, what it doesn't work because you have to have the presence of someone in the scenario as an element of the story. Absolutely. You need the production and the consumption to be aligned so that you can there's so much innovation happening all across you know all across so many different industries and across across our lives but if we look at what we're talking about you mentioned the 360 video and why it didn't work and it like production kind of went way ahead and it was here and the consumption didn't really kind of catch up but I guess you're talking about these kind of incremental movements to this new language moving towards this new language both from the workflows in the newsroom and also the consumption of the audience to kind of gradually move to this new exciting place of immersive storytelling where we need to be. And I suppose it never stops, does it? It will always incrementally keep changing. We keep need to, you know, we need to move towards these new formats constantly. It needs to be a constant incremental change rather than kind of expecting things to suddenly innovate overnight. Yeah. And this is really sometimes it's very hard because this is some in many newsrooms, many companies don't have this room for experimentation and for trying things out and accept that they, they won't succeed. But but this is a learning that you have. We want to create something for the first time and make that is a big success, right? And and it's it's not it's never going to be like that. Yeah. Brilliant. So we're coming up uh, to time. So I wanted to close by asking you uh, one more question. So you're based in Barcelona, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. How how's Barcelona at the moment? Has it been very quiet? I imagine for a couple of years without tourists because of the pandemic. Are you starting to see tourists come back back to Barcelona now? Yeah, they're coming. They're coming. I can tell you how many tourists are in Barcelona. <laughs> But, you know, people from Barcelona, we don't want so many tourists coming to Barcelona because it, I think there were, we had too much tourist, tourism for, for the, you know, for the, for a small city. Barcelona is not such a big city. And um, there was a moment, a um, moment that was very, tourism was very unpopular because it's, yeah, you know, it, it takes over the, the city for the citizens. But we like, we like the tourism in a balanced way. And, and and I can tell you, yeah, there are many tourists uh, uh, right now in Barcelona. I can imagine you not know, as many as some, you know, sectors <laughs> would like, <laughs> like the hotels and you know, always want more hotels, more occupation, but you can, uh, you know, you find tourists everywhere right now. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much. It's been so great chatting to you today and, and listening to everything you have to say. It was such an insightful episode of The Craft. I uh, really thank you for inviting me, for letting me talk 
talk about what is my passion. And uh, sorry about my English. It's no, it's absolutely perfect. It's been so great speaking with you. So thank you so so much. Thank you so much, Tom, for everything. Thank you for checking out this episode of The Craft. This show is brought to you by Shorthand, a platform that helps professional content creators produce beautiful stories without writing a single line of code. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow The Craft wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Or visit shorthand.com slash podcast to get immediate access to all the latest episodes.